Hello, I'm John Hanrahan and welcome. Arguably now the world's biggest movie star of the 21st century, Tom Cruise's already burgeoning stardom was literally given jet propulsion with his leading role in British director Tony Scott's film Top Gun for Paramount Pictures. The year was 1986. Tom was just 24 and it was his eighth film after hits like Risky Business and All the Right Moves. With the long-awaited sequel Top Gun Maverick about to be released, I went back to a conversation I had with Tom at the time when he came to Australia for the movie's local launch. We spoke about the challenges of making the original film, his family and his personal struggles growing up with dyslexia. But I began by asking about the excitement, thrill and the physical impact of his first ride in an F-14 jet fighter, as well as the attitudes of the experienced US Air Force pilots he was working with on the film. Tom, let's talk a little bit about Top Gun first. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you have succeeded in doing something that I wouldn't have the guts to do, and that's getting up in a plane, uh, the F-14 that like climbs 30,000 feet in a minute and that sort of thing. What Can you describe what is the sensation of actually being in it when it takes off and heads for the sky? Um, euphoric. It is uh, the most amazing feeling. I mean, for me, I, uh, you know, I like fast you know, bikes and everything else, and you're sitting just on, on top of, uh, you know, machinery that has about, capable of about 30,000 pounds of thrust and going, you know, twice the speed of sound and more, you know, three Mach. And it is quite amazing. It's just uh, exhilarating. Fear? Uh, I think it's it's more excitement, you know. I mean, I was just really, I was just really pumped, you know, ready to go. I'd, I'd had many months of training uh, and working on the film and uh, training just to be able to sit in the back seat because there's responsibility back there just in getting the aircraft to take off and uh, land. So, uh, and also I had to know how to punch out just in case something went wrong. <laughs> That's what I mean. Uh, yeah. The element of fear uh, would, have, would have had me uh, saying no thanks very much. I don't know. It was, it was too exciting, you know. I mean, it was really... You know, you're just holding on. Is there a physical effect? Is the, does the force of the plane actually <clears throat> force you back in the seat? A little bit. <clears throat> Not like it used to. I mean, the old aircrafts, when I, you know, when I was studying film, and, uh, you know, when they first started the carriers and, the, you know, the cat shots, they were literally, uh, sometimes the, you know, they were facing so many Gs that the, the pilot would black out, and sometimes he's waking up and he's in the air. I mean, just your, I mean, just for a second, you know, not even, you know, not even a second. And, uh... You, you mostly feel the force uh, when you're banking left or right, you know, you're pitching up or, or, or down. Uh, pitching down, you're, you're facing negative G-force, and uh, uh, up or, you know, left or right, you're, you're facing positive Gs. Now, a G, one G is one times your body weight pressure against yourself. And so uh, I pulled up to eight Gs, eight and a half Gs, actually. So that's eight and a half times, you know, like a baby My elephant way. sitting on top of like you. Like a baby at China, <laughs> and it's forcing the blood from your brain. And you've got a G-belt that's actually hooked into a computer that fills up with air that keeps the blood from all going down, you know, into your lower section. You've got to, you know, grip your legs and your butt and your stomach, you know, and your back and your arms, and you just really have to almost grunt. It's You're forcing the air hard just to keep the blood circulating in your brain because your peripheral vision starts closing in, and you, you know... You take a little ride with the black wall, as they call it. You know, everything just closes in, and you, you know, you go down for a second. How many times did you go up, and, and how long each time were you up for? Well, I flew uh, with the Blue Angels, which is a precision flying uh, corps out uh, of the Navy, and they fly uh, subsonic A4 single-engine, single-man aircraft. Which uh, I flew in a TA4, which has a, a back seater, and I actually took over the stick at one point just to do. Uh, you know, some barrel rolls. It's got a turning radius of 720 degrees per second, which is wing overs. And <clears throat> the F-14, I had three two-hour hops in it. You know, and I, uh, we, I went each time. They took me twice the speed of sound and uh, took me for a ride. We had five minutes of film in the camera and 35 minutes of fuel. So we went for, you know, our briefing. I, I knew these pilots for about eight months, and I said, uh, Bozo was my pilot. I said, Bozo, man. So let's get it over with. So we got up there, shot all the film, and then, then went for a ride on Paramount, you know. Came back and told Paramount, boy, we just made it. I mean, we just had enough fuel to get all that film in, you know. <laughs> You're an actor playing a role, but you, uh, you, know, you were working amongst the real pilots and so on. How, what was their attitude to you? Because uh, 
in any profession, when somebody comes yeah. in and pretends to be what you do, there's a certain you know level of jealousy, even if it's a subliminal one. Well, actually, uh, I don't know. I'm an easy guy to get along with, and I was very open. I mean, I spent a lot of time with them, and they're great storytellers. And I mean, all of them have these amazing stories to tell you about the things you know that go on with them. I mean, the call sign for my character was Maverick. Now, each of these pilots have different call signs, you know, and they all all of them have you know five stories behind the you know why they're called this, and. Uh, so you can imagine some of the names that they, you know, that they're stuck with for the rest of their lives. <laughs> and uh, at first they were a little apprehensive, you know. I, uh, uh, you know, they were a little concerned, you know, me coming in. They wanted to make sure that they were represented, you know. They were they were very tired, and so was I. And you know, the movies being, uh, you know, pilot to co-pilot, Roger pilot, you know, mm. you know, Roger co-pilot. This is the pilot, you know, that kind of uh, never really. They never felt that that uh, they were really never represented in terms of just getting the fighter pilot, the spirit and soul, you know, of the fighter pilot. So I spent a lot of time, you know, down there working with them, and a lot of the stories and stuff that happens in the films taken from, you know, the things that they've, uh, you know, they told me. At what point do you think or do you feel that that you'd sort of convinced them that you were doing a pretty good job? Well, at one point when I was I, I was in the O Club, and I, you know, you go and we were shooting late and I came into the that's the officers club and they go there on Wednesday nights and at lunchtime and I went in to have a beer with some of the guys and uh, you know just talk about the film and you know everyone I was just always there I just wanted you know to assure them and you know hear more ideas as we we're going along and uh, just a couple of people th actually thought I was a fighter pilot you know in there you know I'd walk around and they you know they you know, sometimes uh, salute me when I was walking in and out of place. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't tell them anything different. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been a nice buzz, actually. Yeah, it was. Getting that reaction. Yeah, it was. You, you were also on one of the aircraft carriers as well, which must have been quite an incredible experience. Yeah, that was. Yeah, uh, and the Enterprise. Uh, I, <laughs> it is prison with the threat of drowning, is how I. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's a hard life, you know. We I spent uh, four nights there. Uh, some of the other actors only spent a couple of days, and I we're shooting around the clock, just picking up shots where we can. And uh, the environment is one of it's exciting and it's dangerous. You know, you're out on that flight deck. I felt like I was in a Dolly painting. You know, this very surreal kind of pale yellow light across the deck, and these jets being just tossed off. You know, into darkness with full afterburners going, and these guys are on the deck, and everyone has a job to do. And, they actually have nets on the side of the carrier because uh, when the planes come in, they don't call it a landing. It's actually a controlled crash. You know, mm. uh, they're coming in at 150 miles an hour from 150 to zero. That deck is sometimes is pitching 15 feet, and you've got your buddy who's a pilot who's an LSO guiding you in. The pilot himself doesn't even see the carrier. He's got to keep his eye on uh, three lights that are to the left, and that's all he has to watch. He's watching these lights, and he's listening to his friend because the nose is up when they're coming in, and uh, they don't see the carrier until they've landed on it. And sometimes that cable snaps, goes ripping across that deck, and you know people are sucked into the engine. It's, mm. uh, I mean, Did you see anything go wrong at all? I mean, were there any accidents while you were no, shooting the film? No, they're very efficient. Uh, actually, the week before we went, People were a little nervous because, uh, first of all, the Walker incident happened in America where there was spies uh, in the Navy. So when we went out to sea, we were flown around in circles for hours before we'd land on there. There's only, you're only allowed to take pictures of certain things, and uh, you know the full cockpit is not shown in the film. Certain instruments are cut out you know, because they don't, you know, it's just... For security reasons. For security reasons. Mm. And... Uh, a week before, you know, that incident happened, there was a cable s snapped and uh cable came ripping across and, and cut a guy in half. You know, I mean, mm. stuff like that happens. It's, uh, well, like that, they're away for 14 months sometimes, nine months, these fighter pilots and the crew, you know, not seeing their families. And uh, it is a it is a tough life, and they don't get paid anything for it. From your point of view, was it as physically a harder film as doing all the right moves, which, of course, was a football film, essentially? Well, the... The thing that was tough about all the right moves was that uh, we were shooting the football live, and everyone, you know, we'd have the play and they'd set the cameras up, but by the second take, everyone knew where everyone was going. So, you know, 
we were getting everyone was getting concussions because they were going at it, you know, full bore, smacking heads each time to make it look good. So, <laughs> that aspect, I mean, uh, you were pleased you were a quarterback. <laughs> actually, I played a cornerback in that, which a is right. defense, which I was cracking heads the whole time, you know, and uh, so that that uh, that shed a little light on the situation. But it, it, you know, both both films are physically grueling, you know, mm. films to make. Can we go back a little bit and, and, and look at your career? You've, you, you've had a, a most amazing career in many ways. Uh, uh, sorry, life more than career. You've moved around the States quite a bit and uh, yes. your family was split up, at least your father left. What, what sort of an effect, looking back now, I know your mother and sisters were extraordinarily supportive. In fact, I think you said you've described them as a team, which yeah. I thought was really nice. Yeah. But it must yes. have been hard still, moving and, and uh, finding new friends and so well, on. Well, you know, for me, I preferred it. I like moving around. And it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't something that we necessarily looked upon as being difficult because we had each other, you know, and uh, it was almost an adventure, you know, moving to a different place. And, uh, I mean, having not known anything else, it was just something you just go and do. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine living in the same place for my whole life. Mm. But did you feel that you had a lonely boyhood? No, no, I didn't. Uh... I mean, I I had uh, my family, you know, and people uh, around me at times, and uh, I mean, it wasn't lonely. I wasn't lonely. Mm. But moving into a new place always doesn't matter how amenable and open and easy going you are. It always is hard to sort of strike up new friendships in a way. Oh sure, I mean that aspect of it. I mean, being the new kid every year, you know, there's always that, you know, that guy who's got to come up and pick a fight with you, you know, the first day to kind of test the water or. Uh, you know, You've had a few of those, have you? Yeah. <laughs> I went through a few of those. <laughs> by, by the look, you've escaped pretty well unscathed. <laughs> I'd hate to see the uh, other guy. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, that, that aspect of it was uh, challenging and, and, I mean, difficult. I, I, but it was also exciting, you know. Uh, it's always picking up a new sport or, you know. It was always I had the wrong accent and, you know, the wrong shoes going into a situation. But, uh, you know, I looked at it more as, you know, uh, you know, made it positive. You know, I, you know, I mean, you, I believe in life you can make things go your way. Mm. You know, you can take something in and, you know, make it positive. You know, anything can be negative, you know, if you want to you know, put the wall up. But, mm. uh, I mean, we, we all made it work. You uh, you also have uh, a small problem that a number of actors have, in fact, which is dyslexia. Yes. Which is a very interesting thing for an actor who has to read scripts and memorize lines. So, <laughs> can you can you tell us firstly tell us what uh, dyslexia is? Uh, you're probably better at explaining it than I am. Well, there's various different forms of dyslexia, <clears throat> and different extremes. Uh, for me personally, uh, it was resulted in on a very physical level of not, I mean, not knowing my left from my right hand. It's just something you just, until I found a way of visually dealing with it, of, uh, you know, picturing myself in a car with someone sitting next to me driving and knowing that that person is on the left hand side. I mean, that's when I think of left and right hand, that's why I think of that. I mean, it's just a split second now, but at first you've got to find visual ways to deal with it. And I, certain people they can pick something up and read it and retain it i mean i i have to see it and you know that's why it takes me a long time to read you know i think a lot of people are, are you know have you know dyslexia and i i in the beginning i see c's and d's and little b's and you know little d's mm. i just yeah. you know z, so how do you go about z's backwards how, how do you go about learning a script then well actually you know i read so much now it's uh it really was worse seven years ago when I started out as an actor. When I, I, it took me hours to read a script. I mean, a long, long time. And in going into uh, rehearsals, especially on cold readings, um, it's easy for me to memorize something because I, I, I read over it and I just, you know, I get the essence of, of what it is and then I can go in and ad lib, actually. Mm -hmm. Or if they want it word for word, you know, I mean, it doesn't take me long to memorize something because of it. Uh, and uh, the worst thing was is, you know, being in school and wanting to go to the normal school as opposed to, you know, special schools, remedial readings. So I worked, uh, you know, my 
my mother actually worked very closely with me in, in reading and writing. But now, now it, it, it isn't really a problem, not like it used to be. Have people come up to you uh, and, and said, I'm dyslexic, can you uh, give me some ideas, uh, help me maybe? And you've been able to give some encouragement to them? Well, I think the fact that, I mean, at first I wasn't going to tell anyone that I was dyslexic because I always kind of... In growing up, you always kind of feel, uh, especially in school, I, you know, it was uh, reading in class. You know, it's like that first week of school when the teacher, you know, you're opening a book and everyone's reading a chapter out of... And God, I would sit there and it was, you know, I just wanted to get through the week, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden the tension, you know, and I feel that I'm, I'm sweating in the red face and I know <laughs> everyone's going to think I'm an idiot, you know. But uh, in dyslexia, it's actually... Uh, Dyslexics on the whole have have you know an extremely high IQ, but it's like God's given you, you know, that something to cope with it. And He says, you know, you've got to work for it. Mm. So, uh, you know, I just just by the fact of admitting, you know, when they see w- what I've done with it and where I can go. And there's schools, there's wonderful schools that I, uh, you know, that I work with in, in the United States that uh, that really help, you know people who have dyslexia. And, and you've, since you've become a public figure, you've been able to sort of perhaps absolutely. give that yeah. encouragement. Yes, oh. yes. Yeah, that's, that's why I started talking about it. That's excellent, actually. Charles, uh, Charlie Borman, John Borman's son, is a dyslectic, and a uh, very well-known Australian actor, Bill Hunter, he is also dyslectic. And, yes. Uh, so I, in fact, I'll tell you something after. We've, we can cut this part out, but I'll, uh, there's something else you might like to know about. Um, the stardom side of it. Coming from a, a background where you obviously had both feet planted firmly on the ground, um, I mean, you, you didn't come from a sort of soft Beverly Hills, uh, <laughs> you know, co- comfortable living yeah. world yeah. of stars. Yeah, we all worked since we were very young. So yeah. how's it been, stepping into the spotlight as you have had to do? Well, you know, at first, uh, you know, I didn't give interviews for, you know, about three years because people would ask me questions and I... A lot of it, I felt, was, I mean, things that I, you know, would only discuss with my family. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I just started, I I've, I feel very comfortable with it. I mean, I haven't sacrificed my values, you know, as a person or, you know, my emotional uh, state really hasn't changed as a result of this. I mean, my values haven't changed. You know, I've changed and grown, you know, in, in many ways, just like everyone does, just in dealing with, you know, on a day-to-day basis of living. But, uh, you know, it, it's, I, I enjoy it because it, it enables me to do the kind of projects that I want to do, you know, and do the kinds of films. So, as I said, it's like I, you know, I have no regrets about it, obviously. I mean, I feel very lucky. Mm. <laughs> but in terms of pressure, what, what of it all would be the, the toughest part, if you like, the, the greatest pressure? Well, um, pressure you can put on yourself, you know. Uh, I I tend to, you know, at first I tended to put a lot of pressure on myself. I mean, I always, I'm very, you know, disciplined uh, and put a lot of pressure on myself anyway as a person. I found I've I've got to let go of a lot of it and just realize, you know, I mean, I, the important thing is, is that I'm going to make a lot of mistakes, you know, and uh, just really doing the the films that I want to do. I mean, I I don't look for a result in something uh, on any material level. Uh, in reading something, I read it and I feel what you know. What can I get out of this as an actor, and what you know? How do I feel the experience is going to be? Am I going to learn? Mm. You know, and putting myself into the best, you know, situation. You know, that is conducive. You know, to the type of work that I want to do and the type of environment that I want to work in, and uh, just kind of let everything else, you know, be the way it's going to be. I have to realize what I can control and what I can't control. Mm. Because you know. you've also set up your own company, haven't you? You've, got, you've yes. got your own production company. Yeah, it's it's on a it's a very basic level. Uh, it's just a platform where I can educate myself even more and just work with people who, uh, you know, different writers and different ideas that come to me. Or you know, if I read an article and or you know, write a friend of mine, we want to you know work on something together, and uh, it leaves me available to the studio and studying films, and uh, I mean all of their. Resources. All that goes with it, yeah. Yes. Because yeah. you've done, just done a film, well, not just, but you have recently done a film with Paul Newman, yes. which must have been a good experience and Directed for you. by Martin Scorsese. It was mm. fantastic. You know. Can you tell us a little bit? Because I think it's a sequel, isn't it, to The Hustler? Well, actually, it is It is not a sequel as such. It is Eddie Felsen's character that he, you know, 
played in The Hustler, but it's him 25 years later. It's not necessarily a sequel. Um, it's just his character. And, I mean, he's a whole different guy at this point. And uh, Scorsese and Newman developed this together for, you know, a year and a half, or a couple of years. And essentially, you know, the the Newman character is one of uh, money won is much sweeter than money earned. And my character is I just want someone's best game. He's a very simple you know, kid off the street. He works in a toy store, and uh, you know, I got my girlfriend Carmen, and uh, I, he's a real hot pool player. And I had to learn how to shoot pool and nine ball. And there's actual scenes where I have to clean off the whole table in one shot. You know, so I worked for months. I mean, day and night, <laughs> playing pool with uh, Mike Siegel, who's the world straight pool champion. And essentially, Newman sees me playing, and almost, you know, like the George C. Scott character in that when he was a steak horse, George C. Scott. You know, Newman at this point is a steak horse, you know, kind of a, on a very low scale, you know, steak horse. And he uh, sees me, and because I'm not a face, he wants to take me out and hustle me. And the thing is, he sees a lot of himself in this kid, Vincent, Laurie, you know. So he's he's really drawn to the kid, and uh, and it's just what we go through, you know, the conflict and the, you know, what happens on the road and the battles and the uh, it's a good movie. I was really should happy. Be, should be very interesting. Yeah, I was. I, was, I felt very lucky. You know, I mean, I I do feel very lucky. What about uh, working with Paul? Because he uh, probably saw a lot of himself in you. I should imagine as a young guy starting in the movie industry. Yeah, I guess he did. You know, uh, he's a very unassuming man uh, in terms of. I mean, he doesn't judge anything. He's really giving as an actor. You know, uh, you see a guy who you know, where where he's been and, you know, what he's done. And he's still listening and working, you know, hard, you know, on himself personally and as an actor. And it's uh, it's inspiring. Do you think you learned uh, any number of things from him? Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't help but learn, you know, when you're with Scorsese and Newman. Or in any situation, but I learned a lot of positive things doing the film. Mm. What, what about ambitions? Keep acting, or do you want to really move across and produce and maybe direct? I'm not sure, you know, I, uh, I don't know, my, it's, right now I'm working, you know, with the company just for my thirst for knowledge, you know, and it really is good for me, I mean, ha having all that material available to me, but, uh, I mean, maybe one day if I find something that I'd like to direct or produce, maybe I'll do that, you know, right now I'm, you know, working, just, I don't have any project in development that I'm going to direct or produce, mm. you know. Unless, uh, well, actually, I mean, five things that I might uh, might produce myself, but I don't know about necessarily directing at this point. Right. So uh, apart from Top Gun and uh, the, the Newman film, <coughs> they're the only two films really that you've done in the last sort of eighteen months or so. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. No inclination to go on the stage. Yeah. I mean, I've been looking for plays. Uh, the, you know, I'm I'm offered them and. You know, I mean, that's another element that I'm looking for at this point, reading anything, anything that I could find that's a good character, a good situation to be in. All right, well, all the very best. Thank you. And congratulations you so far. We've enjoyed all the films. Thank you. Cheers. You take care. Tom, of course, has gone on to make more than 40 feature films around the world. The sequel to Top Gun, titled simply Top Gun Maverick, is due for worldwide release by Paramount Pictures in late 2021. Also in the works for Tom are two more... Mission Impossible Movies. Now, if you enjoy reaching back into recent movie history, please join me when I revisit interviews with Goldie Horn, Harrison Ford, Barbara Streisand, Mel Brooks, and the late Christopher Reeve and Peter Sellers. Thanks for listening.